Hey guys, David here and welcome to another video. You've read the title, it's once again time to do some keyboard building and you might think, uh, haven't you built enough keyboards by now? You uh, have like already five keyboard building videos. But well, this time I uh, took it a notch uh, further and uh, wanted to uh, just give it another try to get it a bit closer to perfection as the last times are still in the end had some issues and uh, well of course it didn't turn out perfect uh, again it did turn out quite well and i'm really happy with some of the things i did and i think there's going to be quite a lot of interesting new stuff in this video compared to my old ones now you might remember this keyboard here this is 68 key keyboard that i've built in a previous video it's running on an arduino pro micro just kind of uh, soldered to the back here and uh, the PCP mainly just handles the switch matrix and the LEDs. Now this works decent enough, uh, but I've always wanted to integrate the microcontroller, the ATmega 32U4 that is on the Arduino Pro Micro, directly into the PCB. And there are a lot of people uh, online that have done this and it is actually relatively straightforward. I'll show you the schematics a bit later. Now, when I previously attempted this, I didn't have quite as much success, but uh, this time around, while I didn't do a whole lot different, uh, it worked out perfectly, and uh, that just makes it a lot nicer. I mean, I also integrated support for uh, TNC 2.0, uh, just so that it can be hand soldered as well. That was one of the great things that I also wanted to improve, is just the kind of compatibility. Uh, with the previous uh, keyboards, I just made it compatible with one switch type, one way of assembling it, and that's it. I mean, I was just intending on making like one prototype, so that's it. But uh, for the new ones, I wanted to have it as universal as at all possible. So I uh, created a footprint for the switches that accepts Ch Cherry MX switches, and also the Alps switches uh, with the Cherry MX switch footprint. I can also uh, do all the Gatoron and other Cherry MX uh, clones that have the same footprint. And I also added support for Kale switches, uh, the low profile ones as well, which is quite nice. Though on the last one, I did kind of screw up and put it in backwards. So that one is not actually compatible with this revision, unless you want to solder the keys from the back of the keyboard, which wouldn't really make sense, unless you want an inverted uh, ANSI layout. But Never mind. Uh, doesn't really matter since the main switch that I'm going to be using uh, are some Gatoron switches of various types. And I also made it compatible with hand soldering or surface mount components. Uh, that means that all the diodes have paths for surface mount components and uh, through holes to hand solder diodes. Uh, now, of course, if I want to use the integrated uh, 80 mega 32 u 4 I have to do SMD soldering. Uh, they don't make that component as a through-hole one. But uh, if you're using a TNC 2.0, then all the components necessary can be completely hand soldered. Mm -hmm. And now you might think, what about the LEDs? Uh, so instead of the LEDs which I've been using before, uh, which are the WS2812s, uh, uh, I'm now using the SK6812s in their mini E footprint. And uh, while the regular SK6812s are very, very similar to the WS2812s, uh, the mini E footprint is quite different. Uh, some other uh, people on YouTube have also used it for their PCB uh, keyboards, which is just because it's just ideal. Instead of uh, having the soldering pads on the back of the LED and you having to mount it on the top, the way it is made is that you just have the regular LED and then the pads are on the side. But they're on the side in a way where uh, you cut a hole in the PCB and then mount the LED from the back. And what that allows you to do is for one, because the pads are on the side, it's very easy for soldering. Uh, it actually works great just with a soldering iron, although it's a surface mount component. But it also means that you can install them and exchange them after you've already soldered the switches to the front. Since you, once you soldered in the switches, you don't have access to the front of the PCB anymore. But with them being soldered from the back, if one of them breaks for whatever reason, which has happened on my previous keyboards, uh, it's very easy to exchange it. You don't have to desolder the switch and kind of stick your soldering iron uh, through the uh, mounting holes and everything. That's a huge pain and not really well worth it. But these ones are a lot easier to work with and uh, because they're so much easier to solder, I also did not have any of them break while uh, soldering them, which was a real problem with the WS2812s. They're a bit harder to get, but I'll try to put uh, AliExpress link down in the description. 
And the third big change is that I am not no longer hand writing the code uh, in the Arduino IDE. Uh, while this was great fun, uh, once I realized the potential of QMK, uh, which is an open source firmware, which is a fork of TMK, uh, well, there was really no going back. Uh, it is doing everything that I did, except 10 times better and with 10 times more customizability and a huge team of support behind it. I'll show you more of, of it later, but the gist of it is uh, there's no real reason to ever not use it anymore. It is a bit harder to get used to it because it's just so big and has so many options, but once you do, uh, you can see there's lighting now and I have a bunch of different lighting profiles and I did not have to code any of them. And with that, uh, I believe it is time to uh, take a more detailed look on the building itself. And uh, let's start off with these PCBs. Uh, I'll show you in a second uh, in Ultium Designer, which is what I used to design these. Uh, but then I had them manufactured from PCBWay, as always. Thanks for sponsoring this video, by the way. Uh, and uh, I kind of splurged a little bit, or had them splurge for me, uh, and went with the matte black uh, PCBs and immersion gold plating on the pads. And I mean, in my opinion, these PCBs are some of the most gorgeous PCBs I've seen in a long time. They can easily compete with the most beautiful motherboards out there. And uh, to think that I created this, it's quite amazing. And it doesn't even cost all of that much more uh, than the regular PCBs. Now, of course, with these PCBs, you can't get their great $5 entry price anymore. Uh, they're, for one, a bit too large, and you don't get matte black and immersion gold on these. But if you have a smaller keyboard or pad or any other small projects, you can get PCBs for PCBWay for starting at just $5 for a set of 10 of them with double-sided and even black silk screen, just not matte black, uh, which is a great way to get started. And that's what I used on my first uh, PCB projects as well. Also put a bit more effort into this time, uh, the, just uh, kind of the shape of the PCB, like made it nicely rounded off, uh, have a little protrusion up in the top for the USB-C port so that it could sit nicer and more flush in the enclosure. And I uh, added like my little logo as a like a metallic uh, pad. And so that kind of shines in the nice gold uh, contrasting with the black, uh, which just kind of gives the whole PCB a bit more of a professional feel. Now that didn't stop me from uh, screwing up and forgetting a couple of connections because I uh, had some stuff wrong in the schematic, meaning that uh, there are a couple of air wires that I had to solder in. And I also screwed up the data plus and data minus of the USB port, which I solved by just kind of crisscrossing the resistors that I need there anyhow. I kind of intentionally uh, tombstone them when s and soldering and then uh, connected some wires uh, to the wrong pad, which then makes the signal go the right way. Definitely not ideal, but doing all these modifications on a board that only takes like 10 minutes, which compared to like the half an hour it takes to put in all the LEDs and another half an hour it takes to solder in all the other components, those five minutes of modification are not that big of a deal. But now, how about we head over to the computer and I'll show you a bit more in detail in Ultium Designer, which you can, by the way, also check out down below uh, how I designed the PCBs. I'll show you through the 3D modeling process of the little enclosure that I made and show you the QMK firmware as well in the end. So here we are inside of Ultium Designer, which is one of the industry standard programs for creating PCBs. It has a 
ton of different features uh, that allows for really professional PCBs on uh, like level of like you could create a motherboard in here. That's how many features there are. Now, unless you're a student, uh, Ultimate Designer is not free software, but uh, all the different extra features that it has it does make it worth it if you want to create professional PCBs. For what I'm doing, uh, Eagle uh, was perfectly fine, but uh, just seeing the Ultimate Designer has a dark mode already had me sold. Uh, let's quickly have a look at what I designed in here. So here we have uh, the schematic file for the switch layout. Uh, you can see I kind of arranged it in a way like the keyboard will be uh, down here. We have like the arrow keys escape up here to kind of give you a reference. If we sc scroll in a bit, uh, I created a custom component here for the switch together with the LED to kind of make my life a bit easier. Then here the LED just has data in, data out and ground power. And uh, they are kind of just daisy changed together, uh, starting in at the bottom and going all the way to the top. Then I have, uh, of course, the switch itself, which is uh, connected the columns and the rows together through a diode. The diode is there to prevent uh, any kind of uh, ghosting uh, from uh, multiple switches being pressed at the same time. And then if you ha know anything about matrices, uh, it becomes really uh, weird when you have multiple switches as the like power flows through the switches back into different grids and you can uh, detect key presses that are not actually there. Um, to mitigate that, just simply adding these diodes will do that. Now it doesn't actually matter if you had them this way around or the other way around, it just have to switch it around in software. Ideally, I would have like the, all the rows of the keyboard as rows and then columns as columns. Uh, this would make it the easiest to kind of understand and wire up. Uh, but the 32U4 does not have enough I.O. pins for that. So I had to kind of settle for uh, something a bit more uh, ideal. So I have like the rows uh, until here and the, the bottom one uh, has enough switches. So I believe there are 11 columns and nine rows. And that uh, is a good compromise between having it somewhat uh, like the keys are actually arranged and still saving on some I.O. pins. If we have a look here into the microcontroller circuit, uh, you can see it's actually very straightforward. Here is the microcontroller and it has almost anything already built in. Over here is the USB port and uh, the only really thing that you have to connect is uh, the two resistors um, that are in line with the data signals that's just to meet to USB specification. And you can also add uh, these uh, 5.1K resistors on some of uh, the connections that to configure the USB protocol, but that's only really has any effect uh, if you are using a cable that actually supports more than USB 2.0, which in my case I'm not. So I didn't p bother populating them, but I put them in there so I could populate them if I wanted to. And there's also a half amp fuse as that is the limit of the USB 2.0 specification. And uh, with all the LEDs shining, uh, I can actually easily uh, reach that half amp limit. So I actually put a limit in software that makes it so I cannot uh, exceed the brightness uh, beyond a specific point, which is about two thirds of their actual potential brightness, just to make sure that I don't exceed that power budget. Here, of course, we also have some decoupling capacitors, the values of which I just took out of the data sheet. And down here is the oscillating circuit that provides the clock for the microcontroller. That is just basically for it to keep time. And here we have a 60 megahertz uh, quartz crystal uh, connected to two matched uh, capacitors that create the oscillating circuit. Here on the right, you can see all the I.O. pins uh, connected up to the different rows and columns. And also down here is the ISB programming header. This is just used once and as the 32U4 out of the factory does not have any code on it whatsoever. So it also does not have the code to communicate over the USB protocol, as there are some initialization steps that do need to take place uh, for it to work. So what you need to do in the very first uh, time is 
flash a bootloader on there, which is just a very few simple lines of uh, code that allow it to communicate over USB, and then you can flash all the firmware over USB. So I have a little six pin header, which is kind of the standard, and I'm using a USB tiny ISB programmer. You can also build a program out of an Arduino or a TNC or whatever. It's very simple to do. Uh, I'll link some guides uh, down below. And these are connected to some of the pins, and it doesn't matter that these pins are used for something else later, as uh, this is really only used in the very beginning to pro program it. And I'm not even bothering soldering this connector, just kind of holding it in place while programming. And then having a look at the PCB, uh, I already started uh, fixing some of the mistakes that I did. That's why there, there are some air wires here. But you can see that uh, the red connections are on top, the blue ones on the bottom. So I kind of went for vertical on the top and horizontal on the bottom to minimize the number of vias that I need. And uh, now if we zoom into here, the area around the microchip and the location for the TNC is quite crowded uh, just because of the sheer number of connections that needs to be made. Also generally, there are a few hundred uh, connections in here, so it was quite convenient being able to use the auto router uh, for most of it. Uh, there it just kind of defines some parameters like how thick you want the different connections to be, how far away from the uh, holes and edges, stuff like that, and then it uses the schematic file to kind of find a way to route most of it. And it got about 95% there, which is actually really good. Uh, uh, out of like all the auto routers that I've tried so far, I was very impressed with this one and it only took a couple of minutes to figure that out. There is some kind of limit uh, in the background of how many VS it's allowed to do. So some of the connections it was not able to make, but I could easily add those in in about 10 minutes uh, manually. Uh, just And then I can clean up the other ones uh, to make it look a bit nicer. But uh, routing all these uh, connections actually took not a lot of time at all. The thing that took the longest time was uh, getting all the layout uh, perfectly lined up uh, so that it uh, lines up with the board and is like the correct spacing for the keycaps. And stupidly did a tiny mistake where one of the keys was like half a millimeter lower, uh, which if you don't know about it, you cannot tell. And once the keyboard is assembled, uh, you cannot tell either, but it's just kind of a pride thing. Also quickly wanna uh, have a look here at the footprint. That's the footprint I created for the switches. Uh, you can see here in the dash line is the cutout for the LED where it shines through the PCB with the pads on the side where it is uh, connected. Uh, this makes it really easy to hand solder it. Uh, and here you can also see the cutout for the various switches. Uh, the center post is what all the switches use, and then some of them have uh, side posts as well for stabilization, and I kind of created the outline so that it is compatible with all the different switches. And of course here the pin locations for them. Uh, this uh, pin here uh, together with that one is for the kale switches, and that's the one that is backwards, like this pin should be on the other side, and then that one of course connected to this one here. I'll change that for the next revision. But with that, uh, I also have defined all the 3D models in the background, which then allows me to uh, go into 3D view, which is just one key press away. You can switch back and forth between that while routing your traces, and that is just really convenient to kind of give you a overview of how it's actually going to look in the end in the real world. And that makes it a lot easier to kind of visualize what's uh, going on as it can be kind of daunting just looking at these uh, colored traces all the time. So here you can uh, just see uh, how it looks uh, in the preview. Down here is the ISP programming header that I've mentioned and some reset contacts that are used uh, while programming. Uh, and then this 3D model, I also was able to directly export over to Fusion 360. Uh, and then here you can uh, see that model in here. And this allowed me to then use this uh, to create uh, the sketch for the layout itself. And uh, it is quite a wild sketch and it took me a while to create this, but it's very important that this one is correct as that is what defines the lo location of all the switches. I also went ahead and modeled this parametric so I can go in here, change parameters, and uh, the standard uh, switch uh, size is 14 millimeters. And on my Prusa, that works great. But on my Sidewinder, uh, actually, 
and the 14 millimeters created a hole that was a bit too tight so I could go in here and just change the keyhole diameter to 14.1 and then it will dynamically update all of the hole sizes and uh, but not change any of the location positioning as I have all of that with uh, parameters in here. That's just really nice for kind of prototyping to get everything perfect. As with this many dimensions, uh, going in and manually changing them would be a huge pain. And then with that sketch, I was able to create kind of uh, the main body. Uh, you also can of course see the cutouts for the stabilizers in here. And if I hide the PCB itself, uh, you can see that uh, there is kind of this stepped design. That's because the switches themselves need a 1.5 millimeter thick top layer, uh, but just 1.5 millimeters of 3D printed plastic is not very strong. So I add an, add an extra two millimeters where it does not interfere just to give it more rigidity. I also went ahead and added chamfers here at the top, which is there the, because I'm printing this flat on the build plate here. And uh, sometimes you kind of get an effect that's called elephant's foot, where the first layer squeezes out a bit more to the side. And if you don't have a chamfer here, that means you gotta go to each hole and clean up that tiny bit of squeeze out. But with a chamfer, uh, and just means that if it squeezes out a bit further, then it still is not interfering with the actual hole dimension. And it's small enough to not impede any of the rigidity of the mounting of the switch. You can see that I also had to cut it in half uh, into two parts. That's just because, well, it's too big to fit on any of my 3D printers. And I used some uh, locating uh, features to kind of get that together. If you want to know more about uh, spitting up models, I made an entire video about printing big things. And then on the bottom, I also just has some locating geometry and little snapping pins. And if you look at, sec at a sectional analysis of this, here is the geometry that I used for these snap-in uh, pins. First generation turned out a bit too small, but this one actually works uh, quite well. Uh, it snaps into place and then you can just kind of uh, use your fingernail or the screwdriver to push on here and then release uh, the back. And this means that there are no screws required to open up the back of it. With that, all the hardware is completed and I just quickly want to give you an introduction to QMK. I won't be able to cover everything in here as it's such a huge topic that I could talk for hours about it and I myself have just scratched the surface. Here is the GitHub uh, repo page and you can see it, there is a lot going on. And uh, also to kind of give you a sense of scale, there are almost 1,800 contributors to this project which is just crazy to think that there are that many people uh, contributing code to a custom keyboard firmware. I had no idea and uh, that is why this, there are actually so many features and so much going on. Just the, just the documentation, which by the way is amazing, uh, could easily fill a like 100 page book uh, if you were to print it out. Now, if you are using a keyboard that is already existing, then you don't actually need to worry about any of these files and any of the coding or whatever. They have created an online configurator where you can, can select the keyboard that you have and then you see the layout down here and you can just drag and drop, change out the keyboard layout. You can create multiple layers and have modifiers and then just click on compile and it creates the firmware that you then can directly upload to your board. And even that step, uh, you don't need to use any complicated software. They have made their own uh, little toolbox that allows you to flash files onto these kind of chips that are used in keyboards. This is also the software that I used together with the Teensy USB to flash the bootloader onto it. Uh, I just uh, chose this bootloader, which is even already included in the GitHub repo, so you don't need to uh, go look for it online. Flash it on there and then use the same software to flash the keyboard uh, firmware on there as well. Now, if you have a custom keyboard layout like me, you do kind of need to jump a little bit into code, but that still is fairly straightforward. Here we have the config main configuration file. Uh, now there are a ton of keyboards already predefined. So if you cr are creating your own, that is a great way to kind of learn and figure out how everything needs to be defined. I just looked at a bunch of other keyboards and then took one that looked good to me that was fairly close to what I'm gonna do and then uh, copied it and modified it to be my own. 
Up here I can define the name which then shows up in Windows for the device and a bunch of IDs and stuff like that. But like the main important things that you will have to change if you create your own PCB because it's just different for everyone is like how many matrix rows and columns you have and then which pins these are connected to and here you can also adjust the direction of the diode. Also define the pin for the backlight in here and QMK has great uh, support for all the NeoPixel compatible LEDs. So it was literally just a case of putting in this one pin and it worked. Now that, that's why I also chose uh, this keyboard to modify since that one already had the, all the RGB implemented, but well, there's plenty to choose from. So you, I'm sure you'll find one that is very similar to yours. Then here I also set the software limit for the keyboard brightness uh, it's 150 out of 255 uh, that just makes sure that i don't uh, draw too much current and uh, break any of the usb ports also just one of hundreds of great features is this one here rgb light sleep it's one of those features you don't know you need until you don't have it and my custom written code did not have it so if i set the computer to sleep the backlight would just stay on and I would have to either manually turn it off with key combinations or unplug the keyboard, which is a huge pain. But here, one simple line implements that and you can uncomment it if you want it to stay on. Now, one other thing that you can have to configure that is a bit of uh, a hassle is just the layout itself. And that's because, well, with the matrix, the software kind of needs to know on, a, on the keyboard layout, where does that correspond to your matrix? So up here is the layout. Uh, it kind of is spaced in a way uh, that it represents the layout, like here are the error keys, escape, stuff like that. And then down here are the same key codes and that is how the matrix is arranged logically. That I just have to kind of copy paste together. And after you've defined this once afterwards in the like key map configuration, you can configure it as the way you see it instead of having to worry about how the, it is in the matrix. And speaking of which, if you don't want to use the online configurator or your keyboard is not already defined, you can just modify one of the key map files and it's fairly straightforward in here. You just kind of type in which key you want there to be. Like here I can have key code, KC stands for key code escape, uh, like all the regular ones. This is like the base layout. And then this one here switches to a different layer. And here I have defined a second layer, which allows me to adjust all of the RGB settings, like turning it on and off and changing the modes, uh, brightness, stuff like that. Also have some basic me media control, like volume up, volume down, stuff like that. But you can make this as complicated as you want. And I think it supports up to like 16 layers. So uh, if you have a very small keyboard, you can just by defining it uh, multiple layers, you can have all the keys you ever wanted. And you don't just have to have it so you hold it, you can also have it so it toggles between different layers. You can have it where after you press the key, the next keystroke is from a specific layer, bunch of stuff like that. And if you want to go even more into configuration and have like a very complicated macros, you can use one of the key codes that is not assigned to anything and then go into C code here. And there are a bunch of um, functions already predefined here, for example, this one here gets called every time a key is pressed. Then you already get the key code handed to you here. So you can put a switch statement here for uh, your custom key codes and then have any code run that you want. You can even have like other things connected to the microcontroller and I don't know, play audio or have a light show go off or control some servo motors or whatever. Like the possibilities are endless. And in here, you can also uh, have functions for like when the keyboard starts up, when it's scanning the matrix and all of that. So you can very easily uh, customize anything you want. And that's just standard C. So if you know how to program an Arduino, it's very similar and very straightforward. Now, if you make your modifications here, you do have to, of course, uh, build the firmware yourself, but there's also a very simple tool for that. So it's just a couple of uh, clicks away. And the whole experience after you kind of got an overview and know which files to modify is actually very easy and gives you great functionality. So I'm very grateful to all the people that have contributed to QMK and made this experience quite nice. 
And with that, I believe uh, we have covered most of it. And of course, there's so much more that I, I could mention. I could make an entire hour long video just about Q and K. And that is with me still not really having any clue about all the features. And of course, could talk about our, for hours about the different aspects of it as well. Uh, if you have any specific areas that you want me to like make more detailed videos about, leave them down in the comments uh, so I can, can know uh, which areas are the most interesting to you. Also, if you think these PCBs look mighty fine and I don't really care that uh, they need some air wires soldered to them, I will have some of them on my website uh, down below. I, of course, applied all the fixes already and I'll probably have one or two which include the 32U4 on it that are ready to go. You just need to add the switches to them and the other ones will be uh, just bare since I kind of ran out of a lot of the components like the USB-C connector. But you can hand solder them, them with the TNC 2.0 on the side which and just use that USB port and that'll work great as well. Now if you are interested in a slightly more refined version of this that does not have all the beta box in it and uh, maybe in a slight nice enclosure also leave a comment down below and I might considering making a small run of a revision of these uh, then put them up for sale but I kind of have to uh, know that you guys are actually interested in that before I pull the plug and buy a bunch of these PCBs. But with that, thanks again to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Thanks you guys for watching. If you have any comments, leave them down in the comments. Make sure to like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you guys next time.